I don't need to tell you it's an anniversary now, do I? <laughs> I think we've got that. Just to remind you, though, the Russian Revolution wasn't a single event. No revolution ever is. The most heroic moment was not the one we're here to remember tonight, but February 1917. And since the revolutionary calendar was 13 days behind the one that we all use, we remember that in the second week of March. It started when the crowds turned out in Petrograd, protesters braving a repressive, violent regime. Within a week, the Tsar had abdicated and 300 years of Romanov autocracy had come to an end. The snow was still deep on the streets, but this became the Russian people's spring. It was a heady moment, unforgettable, but by autumn, the picture had darkened. As the days grew shorter and a new cold wind blew in along the Gulf of Finland, the Russian capital braced itself for another upheaval. On the 7th of November, a hundred years ago yesterday, the Bolshevik party came to power. And it is that second revolution, the one the Soviets confusingly call the Great October Socialist Revolution, that I'm going to focus on tonight. I'll look at how it came about, what happened. I'll look at the Bolshevik leader, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, and see what we've learned about his victory and indeed about him. I'll also ask what we should make of today's Russia and today's Russian government, a very different animal indeed, as it struggles with the issue of commemoration. But let's set the scene by reminding ourselves about the regime that took over when the Romanovs were gone. It's relatively easy, in case you're thinking of it, to bring a government down. <laughs> the challenge is to shape and build a state that can run things afterwards. In Russia, as so often is the case, there wasn't any obvious successor to the autocracy. For several days, the situation was chaotic. There was no competent leadership at all. Anarchy like this is dangerous at any time, but what made it really deadly in Russia was the fact that the country was at war. It was fighting Germany and Austria-Hungary in the First World War. And the Russian economy, all those factories, all those railway yards, were fully engaged in war production. Without some clear direction, the Russians risked a national catastrophe. So it was to save the nation at its hour of danger that a group of politicians, former members of the state Duma, or parliament, agreed to act as a caretaker provisional government. But working people didn't merely sit and wait. In Petrograd, the workers rushed to elect deputies of their own, and there assembled on the first night of the New Age a much larger and noisier body called the Petrograd Soviet. So there were two new governments, not one. In the class-based language of the times, the provisional government represented the bourgeoisie. As you can see, its members were well-fed, well-dressed, and very good at beards. Its first chairman was a prince called Georgi Lvov. By contrast, the Soviet spoke for ordinary working citizens, the people Karl Marx called the proletariat. You can get some idea of the scale of the chaos by looking at that crowd in that building. The room they're in was originally built as a ballroom to accommodate 5,000 couples, all of them dancing. So you can imagine how many people there are crammed in there. When it settled down, the Soviet had about 1,000 members and a much smaller executive committee. It included intellectuals and journalists, as well as workers and soldiers. But what mattered was that ordinary people believed it was theirs. Now, to have two governments at any time is tricky. But to have two entirely different ones at a time of national crisis will create endless challenges. The two bodies met in the same building in those early months, but conveniently, as you can see, it had two wings. It's the Tauride Palace in St. Petersburg, and it was a drafty barn of the place then, and it's a drafty barn of a place now. In March, the new ministers, the so-called bourgeoisie, 
occupied a splendid suite of rooms on the right, in the right wing of the building, which was the one nearer to the city centre and slightly warmer. <laughs> Rather reluctantly, they assigned the bleaker and less accessible left wing to the people's noisy Soviet. There were soldiers on the stairs. There were young men eating sardines in the grand ballroom, unwashed and exhausted strangers everywhere. And somehow this chaos had to be reduced to streamlined administration with a clear chain of command. The answer to the question how that was to be done was dictated by another gentleman with splendid hair. Karl Marx had insisted that revolutions should always follow a specific pattern. Each state would have to undergo a democratic phase to prepare its people and economy for the bliss of proletarian revolution. On this model, Russia, a largely peasant country, wasn't ready to be ruled by its workers. It may have been a crude reading of Marx, but it was what people chose to believe that spring. Most Russian socialists were certain that their revolution was a bourgeois democratic one. You can imagine the delightful hours that members of the Soviet passed on their first night as they debated this. There were guns going off outside at the time. After a lot of wrangling, the Soviet accepted the sovereignty of the provisional government for the short term. They urged the ministers to carry on, and they were convinced that history required this. In the new bourgeois democratic world, the Soviet's job was just to fight for workers, soldiers, and peasants' rights. So far, so good. But then the politicians had to do some real governing. They had to agree what to do about workers' conditions, food prices, discipline in the garrison. But the toughest question of all was what to do about the war. The crowds who made the revolution were expecting a solution. The dearest hope of many hungry, tired civilians was that someone was about to make peace. But Russia's old political class were men of the world. They also held significant corporate stocks. Several members of the new cabinet had made their money out of selling guns, and they expected to continue with the war until a di diplomatic settlement was reached. The outcome was a fudge. After another night of wrangling between the cabinet and the Soviet, the two wings of the Tauride, the provisional government told the world that Russia recognised its duty to fight on, much to the relief, I might say, of the British. It would do so, however, in the name of freedom and democracy, to put an end to Prussian militarism, not for the gain of colonies, and its goal was to achieve a just peace for the working people of the entire European continent. That clumsy compromise, we go on fighting but not quite in the old way, was fine for a few weeks that spring. What spoiled it was a brute infusion of reality. In late June 1917, the Minister of War, Alexander Kerensky, approved a fresh offensive in Galicia. It wasn't a defensive operation against Prussian militarism, but theatrical heroism. It was a stunt, really, and its purpose was to capture the national imagination and rally faltering support for the provisional government and, if I'm honest, for Kerensky personally. Since he's going to play a large part in our story, I think we need to meet Kerensky at this point. Alexander Fyodorovich was a lawyer and a socialist, but you need to know more than that. Here he is modelling his trademark military tunic, which incidentally was adopted by the Bolsheviks later on and became the standard Bolshevik uniform. You see Stalin wearing what is effectively Kerensky's creation all the way through the 30s. But he also loved his kaftan and silk Turkish slippers and his cheroot. And he wore them a great deal in the spring of 1917 because he was recovering from a major kidney operation. His illness had left him pale and gaunt, but nothing could stop him from taking centre stage. He loved to perform, and he loved to perform looking pained. 
He looks as if he were in pain, a British diplomat recalled, but all the same, he gives such a fine impression of energy. And the young Kerensky, he was 36 in 1917, put that energy to full use throughout the revolutionary year. On public occasions, which he loved, he could mesmerise a crowd with his oratory. Behind the scenes, he could fix quick deals through an extensive network of contacts. He was the sort of person revolutions always favour for a while, and Lenin hated him. Kerensky's June offensive started well. Led by the brilliant General Brusilov, it opened with artillery bombardment, which is always a good way to make an impression. But even Brusilov couldn't hold the Russian army together for long. Morale had been flagging for months. The revolution hadn't solved any of the workers' basic problems, and in many ways it had made them worse. Mass desertion was already causing entire regiments to fall apart, and during the campaign that late June and early July, around 400,000 men were lost. Defeat brought desertions on an even grander scale, humiliation for the Russian army and shame to the revolution. In short, Kerensky's gamble had failed. The news sparked rioting in Petrograd. Pitched battles broke out between right-wing black hundreds and red banner-wearing socialists, and 700 were killed in the city in three days of fighting. It was such a harrowing incident that it went down in history as the July days. Production came to a halt. Shops were boarded up. Barricades appeared on the streets. Trams were overturned. Nervous people stayed at home, and in answer, Kerensky, bravely and publicly, called fresh troops into the city. These quashed the insurrection in pretty short order, but now people began to whisper that maybe a counter-revolution was on the cards. To stave off its complete collapse, the provisional government regrouped. Kerensky himself became prime minister on a promise of order stability, and the efficient management of the war. So the July days marked a watershed. At the time, a good many socialists believed that political life had shifted to the right. Kerensky's government called for an end to strikes, and as the summer wore on, it took ever more repressive measures to keep the workers working and prevent protests and the loss of working days. August and September saw a reversal of earlier workers' gains as employers introduced wage cuts and repeatedly extended the working day in a vain effort to meet the demands of war. And that brings us to Kerensky's relationship with the far left. The July days gave the provisional government the excuse it had been looking for to make some high-profile arrests. And the list included many leading socialists. Of those they actually caught, the most prominent was this man, Lev Trotsky. He was imprisoned on the 7th of August on vague charges of counter-revolution. Trotsky, like Kerensky, was to play a central role in October's events. Born in 1879, he was 37 at the time of his arrest. He was a maverick revolutionary, a brilliant speaker, and Kerensky's true nemesis. He was stubborn, unconvinced by Lenin's leadership or Bolshevik ideology. But the crisis that July propelled him into the Bolshevik party and right up to the top of it. As he recalled much later, the conversations he had in prison with his comrades established moral bonds of the sort that are forged only under the enemy's heaviest blows. Drama again. And those moral bonds were to prove very strong indeed. Though Stalin tried to write Lev Trotsky out of history, the Great October Le Revolution, Lenin's revolution, would have been unthinkable without him. But that is to anticipate. We still have to deal with Lenin. Kerensky's Justice Department had been collecting evidence against him for weeks, and now it brought a charge of treason. In fear for his life, Lenin fled to Finland. But it wasn't a dignified exit. For several nights, in fact, he and his friend Grigory Zinoviev went into hiding in a haystack near the factory town of Sestoretsk on the Russo-Finnish border. In Soviet times, that haystack became a revolutionary shrine, though as you see, they had to put a railing round it to keep the donkeys off. 
they're really there. With Lenin gone and insurrection discredited, that marked shift to the right was real. Ultra-nationalists began to call openly for a military coup. The rhetoric of the provisional government turned sterner with a warlike ring. But rhetoric was useless in the medium term. While Kerensky struts in yet another natty uniform, let's pause and consider what was really going on at the end of July. First, there was that clumsy dual power. The executive committee that ran the Petrograd Soviet had continued to acquiesce in Kerensky's regime. But the nature of politics was changing. The Soviet itself had moved to a new address, a former girls' school called the Smolny Institute, now with Statue of Lenin. I can't get rid of it for the photograph, I'm afraid. The move gave it more space, but Smolny was a long way from the city centre, even further than the Tauride. In every sense, there was a growing distance between the Soviet and the bourgeoisie. Though no one was quite ready to say it yet, the dual power had already failed. The only remaining question was about what should replace it. The revolution unraveled under Kerensky's nose. His type of bourgeois compromise was never going to satisfy the hopes that February had raised. His war required the factories to run white hot, but he could give nothing back in return. There was no extra money to pay wages. Why does this remind me of Brexit? And no guarantee of food. Meanwhile, in the countryside, which was where the food came from, the peasants gave up waiting for his land reform. They started claiming title to the land themselves, driving out the landlords and seizing animals and tools. In many places, former country mansions burnt. The army was dissolving by the hour. Most soldiers were peasants, so any news of change in the village had them dashing home to make sure they weren't being robbed. <coughs> but disillusionment, lack of hope, drove even more to abandon the front lines, and in the summer of 1917, the Russian army literally melted away. There was no way Kerensky could honour his commitment to the war. In different circumstances, these things might well have brought about a military coup. There were some officers already talking of that. <coughs> but the crucial thing about Russia in 1917 was that there were already organized and energetic groups campaigning for another option. Russia's revolutionary parties had been building up mass followings. For years, the most active had nurtured a wide, committed, grassroots base. I'll come to the leaders in a moment, but it's worth remembering that the largest parties, the Bolsheviks and Mensheviks in the towns and the socialist revolutionaries across the whole society, had activists in many thousands of communities. The Bolsheviks, to take the most conspicuous example, had members in key factories. These were not do-gooders from the universities or tall, thin student types with bombs marked bomb. They were working people who had become convinced by the ideology and promises of Marxism. They spent their spare time reading and discussing politics and, significantly, helping fellow workers with matters like health, labour rights and social insurance. They might be young, they might be male, but they were on the spot, in touch with life, and they represented the germ of an alternative civic and political system. The socialist revolutionaries, the SRs, had a similar network in the countryside, though it was patchier. Where there were party members, though, the talking and the meetings had been going on for years. This matters because revolutions have a duty to rebuild. As I said right at the beginning, it's hard to rebuild when you have brought a country down and you need a culture of shared hope. October's revolution wasn't made by a few famous individuals standing on a platform in the middle of a square. It also drew... drew upon the hope and energy of millions. <coughs> that is not, of course, to say that everyone agreed about the way forward. The very radiance of people's dreams is dazzling. For Russia's peasants, utopia meant the undisputed ownership of village land and a communal life that was governed by moral, deeply religious norms. The red star of Marxism looked very pale in the blinding gold of their imagined cornfields and their sunlit, self-governing communities. 
They weren't happy with the status quo, though. Getting rid of unjust debt and bureaucratic interference, those were the things they wanted to fight for, and getting their soldier sons safely home. But there were as many ideas about the future as there were human beings talking at those endless meetings. The workers could be even more diverse. Some wanted to run their own factories, perhaps on scientific lines. Some wanted to end the evil of industry altogether. Some wanted free love, and some wanted a classic list of rights for women. Some wanted to safeguard legal structures and property rights. Others pressed for communal ownership of wealth. And that's before we start on their attitude to religion, the afterlife, or self-determination for the scores of national minorities inside the Russian Empire. But what was clear, even in the midst of this cacophony of voices, eager, urgent, hopeful, terrified, was the growing belief that the People's Soviets would have to take power sooner or later. There was an increasing conviction, especially among the more radical socialists of Petrograd, that the Soviets, elected at the workplace and speaking directly for the masses, were the only viable government for a country in revolution. Every anti-worker move Kerensky made helped stoke this mood, the thirst for Soviet power. But it was all theoretical, and the debate might have dragged on into another year or ended in a bloodbath and a right-wing counter-coup. The answer was to come from this unappetizing man. It is no exaggeration to say that the October Revolution couldn't have happened without Lenin and wouldn't have done. Among the many reasons, I shall focus on two. First, Lenin was the only Russian politician to regard revolution as his sole purpose in life. In fact, I can't say very much else about his personality, however much I might like to. I can't offer you fascinating private weaknesses unless you count his fondness for Swiss chocolate. He didn't have a lurid sex life. He was married and he had a mistress who would later become a family friend. The mistress and his wife sat mending Lenin's clothes together. That's not very raunchy. In that regard, he was more respectable than many members of the so-called bourgeois provisional government. As to hobbies, he gave them up the minute they distracted him from politics. So that put paid to Beethoven and then to chess. He certainly did press-ups in his room. He even did them in his prison cell. But he did them to keep fit for the revolution, not for pleasure. When he was still a youngish emigre, a Menshevik called Pavel Axelrod summed Lenin up by describing him as the only man for whom revolution is the preoccupation 24 hours a day, who has no thoughts but of revolution, and who even in his sleep dreams of nothing but revolution. No wonder he only had two lovers. During the First World War, when the German foreign ministry was looking for a Russian who might undermine the Romanov war effort, its secret agents were unanimous in pointing to Lenin. He was the only revolutionary who preferred action to talking, the only one ruthless enough to deliver on his promises. And after February, as Russia began to dissolve into chaos, Lenin was one of the very small number of human beings who actually wanted power. He dreamed of nothing else, in fact. It's one thing to dream, though, and another to have any real competence. The second point about Lenin is that he shaped his party into an effective revolutionary force. Imagine a ball of energy in human form and add a beard and you will have a picture of the man. But now dismiss the idea that his trick was to create robotic uniformity within the party's ranks. That's a myth about the Bolsheviks. Remember the grassroots, those activists with all their dreams? They weren't forced to think like zombies during 1917. The party's very flexibility was one of its most potent strengths. So we should be specific about Lenin's role. The leader made two crucial interventions in 1917 and both were dazzling and dramatic. His first and greatest coup took place not in October, but in April. Many of you will know that the Bolshevik leader had been in exile in Switzerland throughout the First World War. Getting home from landlocked Zurich was not straightforward. In the absence of aeroplanes, he needed to cross Europe overland, and in the end, he had no choice 
but to steam through Germany via Berlin. This map from my book, Lenin on the Train, available in all good bookshops, <laughs> shows his route. It took him to the Baltic coast and then through Sweden. But it was the German stretch that was really controversial, opening him to a charge of treason for consorting with his country's enemy. The Germans, of course, helped him precisely because he was known to be a five-star troublemaker. Everyone knew it. The British would probably have interned him if he'd opted for a route across the English Channel. In the circumstances, the provisional government might well have called for his arrest too, but in the springtime of hope, members of the Soviet could still insist that every honest revolutionary had a right to return to Russia. It was time to reject those years of Tsarist repression. The Finland station in Petrograd saw welcoming ceremonies almost every night as exiles from the Tsarist years came back in triumph to participate in the People's Revolution. There were brass bands and bouquets and red flags. It was like a rolling street party. And the welcome for Lenin was unforgettable. The Bolshevik leader's train arrived from Finland at 11.10 p.m. on Orthodox Easter Monday, the 3rd of April, by the Russian calendar. The band struck up. The welcoming committee chairman cleared his throat for the usual speech. But there was nothing routine about what happened next. Tired though he must have been, he'd been travelling for eight days solid, Lenin used the opportunity to launch his new political programme, the April Theses. And his message was so shocking that even his wife decided he'd gone mad. If you remember, April was still a time when Russia was trying to get behind the war. By contrast, Lenin called for an immediate peace. He even advocated fraternisation with German soldiers at the front. This war, he said, had nothing to do with working people. It was a war between bankers, a war for profit, and patriotism was redundant at a time of international proletarian uprising. That statement shocked his audience and led to renewed calls for his arrest, but there was more to come. At a time when the Soviet was trying to work with the provisional government, and at a time when the Soviet's leaders were still secretly glad that established politicians were running everything, Lenin, condemned all collaboration with the bourgeoisie and called for a transfer of power to the Soviets. And while property rights were still essential for the liberals, Lenin called for the nationalisation of land. On that first April night, the whole programme seemed crazy, the work of an exile who was out of touch. No one thought that Lenin understood the situation in the capital. But just three weeks later, he had his whole party on board. He got them there by persuasion, by pressure, and also by attracting people in the ranks who actually thought he was talking sense. And the effect was to reshape his party as the true voice of the revolutionary vanguard, the group that talked the toughest line. And when the hopes of that first spring began to fade, to be the party that talked tough, to be the extreme left, was a very good image for a revolutionary party to have. The war might still have been a sacred cause when Lenin stepped down off his train, but from July it had become a national disaster. Lenin's party reaped the credit for having opposed it from the start. At the same time, the provisional government's stock was also falling. It might have looked all right to everyone in the first hopeful weeks, but by July it had started to behave like the betrayer of the revolution. And only one party of the left had always refused any engagement with it. Support for the Bolsheviks grew steadily in the late summer. It didn't matter whether people understood the small print at the bottom of the programme, almost no one did. What counted was that Bolshevism made people look like the real tough men. The Bolsheviks' success was the work of thousands. It was a matter of hard graft at the grassroots. It was fostered by creative propaganda newspapers, speeches and posters. And that brings me to the question of German gold. The Bolsheviks would always deny it. It would have looked like treason. But Lenin had unquestionably accepted German cash to go and make his revolution. His ultimate aim, after all, was to destroy capitalism on a global basis. 
To him, there was a poetry in the idea that someone like the Kaiser might pay for that. The trouble was that German money also brought him to the brink of real defeat. The July days came close to wrecking everything. Amid suspicion of treason and rumours of having taken that German gold, the, the Bolsheviks' newspapers were shut down and their leader, the lion of the left, went into hiding, remember. Sitting under all that hay, a lesser politician might have given way to understandable despair. But the real coup was yet to come. And what made it a huge success was that it didn't go the way poor Lenin planned. The Bolshevik leader spent August and most of September 1917 in Finland. He still remained a wanted man. He probably enjoyed reading about alleged sightings of him and even rumours that he was dead. But it must have been even more delightful to follow the faltering career of Kerensky's provisional government as it lurched from crisis to crisis and the newspapers lovingly reported each lurch. On the ground, the revolutionaries in Petrograd believed they were living through a backlash and perhaps a permanent defeat. But to Lenin, it was clear that Kerensky couldn't manage the war effort, nor even the unrest in his own capital. It's hard to isolate one fatal mistake among the many that our friend Kerensky made, but his request for military reinforcements in Petrograd to shore up his government stands out. In late August, he requested backup from the patriotic troops of General Lavr Kornilov, a Tsarist officer who will be forever remembered as the man with a lion's heart and the brain of a sheep. <laughs> Kornilov hated lefty softy Mr. Kerensky, so this was a chance to be seized. Instead of coming to the provisional government's aid, he started preparing to shake things up and bring some military order to the scene. The luckless Kerensky was suddenly faced with the task of resisting a military takeover. His first instinct was to set up a dictatorship. He was going to call it a directory of his own. It was the response of a desperate man, but it was utterly irrelevant because it was the people themselves who now repelled Kornilov. Alarm whistles went off in the factories. Railway workers prepared to take up track. Sailors at the Kronstadt naval base set out to join their comrades on the streets of Petrograd. In almost every workers' district, armed detachments of activists began to practice military drill. Kornilov's advance was halted under overwhelming pressure from the organised forces of the left. It was a multi-party socialist initiative, a proof of the strength of Soviet power. The Petrograd Soviet saved Kerensky, but then it presented its bill. It demanded the release of its leading members, the prisoners who'd been held since the July days, and on the 4th of September, Trotsky was freed. As he became the Soviet's new chairman, there was an increasing risk, of, sorry, there was increasing talk of introducing Soviet power. And people thought they could see an opportunity to do just that on the horizon. An all-Russian Congress of Soviets bringing delegates together from the whole empire had been scheduled for the 20th of October. It was to meet in Petrograd and bring together people from the whole country so it could have taken over the government of Russia in the name of the entire revolution. Out there in Finland, Lenin's attitude to all this was cautious. He couldn't risk a second defeat like the July days. He warned against the temptation to seize power before everything was ready. But his patient conciliatory mood changed suddenly in mid-September. On the 5th of September, the Bolsheviks finally achieved a majority in the Petrograd Soviet. They were coming the voice of the revolutionary left. But that might change. Delay might cost them everything. And maybe that was one of the reasons why Lenin changed his mind. Whatever it was, though, it's clear that by the middle of the month, he began to call quite suddenly for an armed uprising. His letters even outlined the strategic moves. And his followers, predictably, were horrified. They got used to talking. They didn't want to be out there taking power. As he had done when he reshaped his party's policy in April, Lenin faced the task of convincing them. His second coup, then, began when he pulled a wig over his bald head and set off back across the Russian border. <laughs> 
he arrived in deepest secrecy in late September. Most of his comrades knew nothing of his movements until the night of the 10th of October, when they were due to meet in this delightful gingerbread house built for an industrialist and seized by the Soviet of one of Petrograd's districts. And on the night of the 10th of October, the scene of a secret meeting, one of the most important in the Bolshevik party's history. The members gathered and were completely stunned when Lenin joined them, beardless and dressed as a factory worker. His presence was disruptive and shocking. But from his comrade's point of view, it wasn't his appearance or his turning up that did the damage. It was what he said. As he had put it in a recent letter from Finland, history will not forgive us if we do not take power now. The meeting discussed this terrifying proposition for some time and in the end agreed to put insurrection on paper as the order of the day. But no one dared to set a date. Lenin was impatient, anxious to move before the 20th of October, the date when the Congress of Soviet was due to meet. He didn't want to have to compromise, to cut deals with the Mensheviks, or wait for the completion of some bourgeois democratic revolutionary phase. What he wanted was an insurrection in the name of the proletariat, and crucially, on behalf of the world revolution that he thought was about to follow. Since this was heresy to Marxists, it needs some explanation. If you remember, most people believed that Russia was in the throes of a bourgeois revolution. So how did Lenin justify this preemptive strike? The ideas that he'd been working on were crucial here. In 1916, he published an essay called Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism. It amounted to a blueprint for his later plans. In it, he argued that the Marxist scheme of revolution, that neat schedule of successive political and economic transformation, feudal, bourgeois, proletarian, was outmoded. Basically, capitalism had gone global. Some Marxists had already begun to believe that imperialism was behind the reasons why there hadn't been a revolution in Britain, for instance, or Germany. Empire was buying off the proletariat. But Lenin took the idea further. He saw the system of empires and imperialist world trade as a chain. Imperial powers with developed economies selling their products to their colonies. Colonies supplying industrialized superpowers with raw materials. And a chain, he pointed out, long before anybody else did, was only as strong as its weakest link. Being Lenin, he placed himself at the heart of things by insisting that the weakest link was Russia. Its factories were huge, its railways growing at an epic rate, so it was suffering all the disruption of an advanced, sorry, advanced industrial power. But it was also a colony in the sense that it provided Europe with timber and grain. It was a predominantly agrarian economy, a land of peasants. And that contradiction, Marxists always like contradictions, was what made it unstable. With its industrialized urban centers marooned like islands in a sea of agrarian backwardness, Russia was the weakest link in the world economic chain, and when it broke, the entire system of international capitalism would collapse. In the advanced countries, Germany, Britain, proletarian revolutions would follow Russia's, Lenin's, almost immediately, hastened by the hardships that the First World War had caused. Lenin's vision then grew wilder. The next stage, he dreamed, would be a war against oppressors everywhere, the workers and soldiers would turn their weapons on their enemies at home. Lenin was never a pacifist. It was all theoretical, and he had no intention of stepping into a river of blood in person. But what he saw was the October Revolution as the first stage in a global civil war. A war of global liberation, of which he would be the impresario. But what was at stake was the liberation of the world proletariat and the freedom of mankind. So you can see why he dreamed of nothing else. So that's the theory. The insurrection Lenin got, though, was not the one he had expected. The theme in October was not a triumphant Bolshevik march, but rather a complex duet between Kerensky's ministry and the workers, soldiers, and sailors of Petrograd. It was not a world civil war that Russian workers rallied to create. All they wanted was to save the revolution they already had. The news from the front lines was growing desperate. 
Petrograd itself was now under threat from German troops. Kerensky's response, or one of them, was to stiffen the existing garrison in the city with loyal troops and move the Bolshevized elements of the old garrison to the front line. He presented this plan in purely military terms, but it also looked like a move against the left. Rumours began to provoke outrage among the socialists. People believed Kerensky was preparing for a coup. Now more disgruntled radicals began to pin their hopes on the forthcoming Congress of Soviets. And meanwhile, that Congress was put off till the 25th of October, a deferral that was going to play into Lenin's hands. In Petrograd itself, it was Les Lev Trotsky who would take the real lead. Lenin was still a wanted man and scarcely dared to leave the suburban apartment where he was hiding. It was Trotsky's Soviet that set up a military revolutionary committee to prevent a coup against the garrison. The MRC was a multi-party body, not merely Bolshevik, and it was very effective. On the 22nd of October, the garrison agreed to recognise the MRC as its commander rather than Kerensky. The clock was ticking. Each of Kerensky's moves from then was blocked by Trotsky's MRC or other revolutionary forces loyal to it. On the 23rd of October, the MRC took over the Peter Paul Fortress and the nearby arsenal, effectively placing the city centre under its guns. From his office in the Winter Palace, Kerensky was struggling to draw up a military counter plan. But he was already doomed. What sealed his fate was an order to shut down the revolutionary press. At dawn on the 24th of October, provisional government soldiers acting on Kerensky's orders closed the offices of two Bolshevik papers. A few hours later, at 9 a.m., Trotsky's troops reopened them. Kerensky's leadership was worse than merely anti-democratic. It was visibly impotent. By now, Lenin was pacing his suburban flat in what must have been volcanic impatience. He was convinced that the Bolsheviks should take power urgently before the Congress met and all those fuzzy-thinking Marxist windbags got their hand on government. But it wasn't he who shaped events. The MRC was in charge and Trotsky, urging caution, was in overall control. To stave off a full-scale revolt, Kerensky ordered that the bridges of Petrograd should be raised. This would have cut off the traditional routes that workers from the factories took to get into the centre and make their protest felt at the heart of government. The MRC overturned the plan. This time it only needed peaceful action, talking, crowding round government troops to keep the bridges open. A new player in the drama was the battleship Aurora, whose crew joined the revolutionary side, refusing to steam out of Petrograd and staying around to keep another of the bridges open. Unimpeded, free to move, armed workers now appeared at the main telegraph and telephone stations. Another group cut the electricity supply to the Winter Palace, and none of this was a purely Bolshevik campaign. It was the work of the organised revolutionary masses of Petrograd, among them Bolsheviks, but also anarchists, socialist revolutionaries, and many others. Most believed they were preparing for the Soviet to come to power, and that meant multi-party socialism, not Bolshevik rule. By the night of the 24th to 25th of October, Lenin could take it no longer. While his hostess was out, he pulled on a disguise, that wig again and now a bandage round his chin, and set off for Smolny. The guards had no idea who he was when he got there, so they held him at bay for a little while. But eventually, he managed to elbow his way into the building, up the stairs, and onto the third floor where all the action was. As the leader of the largest party in the Soviet his moment had finally come. On the morning of the 25th of October, Petrograd was presented with a manifesto that Lenin had drafted that first night. Citizens of Russia, it read, the provisional government has been overthrown. State power has passed into the hands of the organ of the Petrograd Soviet of Workers and Soldiers Deputies, the Military Revolutionary Committee, which stands at the head of the Petrograd proletariat and garrison. So Lenin hadn't claimed triumph for his party, not yet. But he had achieved another goal. What mattered was that the manifesto was printed and posted up around the streets before the Second Congress of Soviets could open. <laughs>
Indeed, when it did begin its proceedings at 10.40 that morning, the opening speeches were interrupted by artillery fire. The Menshevik and SR delegates walked out in protest. By doing that, they abandoned any chance of multi-party Soviet rule. The principle of proletarian revolution, of an immediate transition to Lenin's kind of power, had won another victory. The first revolutionary government of the new order came into being that same day. Lenin was in charge, Trotsky had responsibility for foreign affairs, and a young chap called Stalin was given the nationalities portfolio. It ruled in the name of the Soviets. Its first manifesto called for an immediate democratic peace, which was Bolshevik policy, but also for the transfer of land to the peasants, which was a policy of the SRs. For a few weeks that autumn, the new regime was greeted with almost euphoric enthusiasm by the working people who had put it there. But Lenin never saw his government as a broad church. He believed he was the agent of history with a big H, and from the 25th of October onwards, he almost never left his desk and bedroom in Smolny, where he worked around the clock, effectively destroying his health. Holding on to power required a focus and discipline that even Lenin must have found hard. But he consistently believed that a world revolution was coming that would rescue Russia and liberate working people right across the globe. Meanwhile, Lenin established a regime he called the dictatorship of the proletariat. The rest we know is tragedy. It's easy to blame Lenin and it's right to do so. His impatience helped to drive through the October days. His ruthlessness was stamped on Soviet leadership. His response to opposition was intolerance. His answer to violence was terror. In December 1917, just weeks after he came to power, his new government established an extraordinary commission with sweeping powers to stamp out counter-revolutionary crimes. It would become infamous as the Cheka. In the ensuing months and years, the Russian Empire tore itself apart. The murder of the Romanovs was but a moment in this tale of slaughter, torture, hunger, terror, slow death by disease. And when the Civil War was over, both ruling party and society had hardened, coarsened, and learnt to hate. So, what are Russians making of this now? The answer, I'm afraid, is not a great deal. The trademark image of the revolution used to be the Great Red Square Parade. By the 1930s, the Soviet government had created a splendid foundation myth for itself. Trotsky's role was edited out, and the Congress of Soviets vanished like a mirage as the celebrations on Red Square grew ever more militaristic and focused around Lenin and Stalin. Above all, though, it was a holiday, the 7th of November by the new calendar, and if you weren't involved in marching, you could spend it getting drunk. The thing was so familiar that it was like a children's story. I have a collection of these cards commemorating 1917. How charming they are, how completely unlike the reality. And then, when Soviet power collapsed and all its dreams were opened up to ridicule, that holiday began to seem a sham. People still got drunk, but no one knew what they were toasting. In 2005, a very old tradition was revived to take the place of the 7th of November. It's called Russia Unity Day, and you're meant to celebrate it on the 4th of November, which was the day of the liberation of Moscow at the end of the Time of Troubles in 1612. The new patriotic holiday is roughly at the same time as the old socialist one, so everyone can go on drinking, and there's still a day off when people need one most. But that doesn't quite deal with the problem, because even a drunk can count to 100. This year is special, and the risk has always been that some bright spark will organise a spontaneous centenary demonstration on Red Square, something the Kremlin cannot allow. It really doesn't do in Russia to celebrate the idea that a crowd might be capable of bringing autocratic government down. So what to do? The Kremlin's answer yesterday, I have to say, was brilliant. And it wasn't a bit like this. <laughs> Red Square was closed to make way for a very public anniversary parade. 
You can watch it on the Russia Today website if you like. They put the whole thing up in glorious technicolor. And you'll see immediately that it's a military affair. The anniversary it's marking isn't the centenary of 1917. There aren't any hammers and sickles. There aren't any communist red flags. Instead, what Russia got yesterday was solemn, iron-cold military stuff. With barefaced, shameless cynicism, yesterday's parade celebrated not a centenary, but a 76th anniversary. It honoured the 1941 parade that itself commemorated the revolution, the 24th anniversary, as it happens. The point is that 1941 was the darkest moment in Russia's modern history, the time when there was a real risk that Nazi Germany might prevail. With the Wehrmacht within a few miles of the capital, the 7th of November parade of 1941 was a grand gesture of patriotic defiance, an unforgettable act of collective courage. By putting its centre stage yesterday, Putin's people managed to substitute a celebration of patriotism, militarism and authoritarian, goose-stepping rule for the anniversary of the world's first ever proletarian socialist revolution. Whatever you think of the politics of that, and I have to say I was nauseated, you have to admire these guys for their sheer nerve. For the rest of the day after the parade, Red Square became an open-air museum free to access of Second World War military hardware. And that's not the only bit of surreality on offer. A new cathedral has also ridden, risen in Moscow this year, dedicated to the martyrs of the revolution. I suppose they mean Nicholas II. What's odd here is that this new cathedral is just one block north of, the, the, north of the Lubyanka, the headquarters of the Cheka, the very body that created almost all the martyrs that the new cathedral is meant to commemorate. It's an irony at the very least. But Russians have forgotten most of the events that I've discussed with you tonight. I hardly need to tell you that Russia sits uneasily with its communist past. There was a time when it was proud to have been a beacon of liberation, the leader of international socialism. Now what people remember from that distant time are red flags, ice creams and jeans that didn't fit. I got a vivid sense of how Lenin has been cut adrift when I passed through the Swedish city of Malmö a few months ago in the course of writing that book. In April 1917, Lenin passed through Malmö on his way from Switzerland to Petersburg. There was a gala dinner at the Savoy Hotel. Knowing there was a plaque commemorating that fact, I asked the receptionist if I could photograph the plaque itself as some kind of commemoration of the event. She looked surprised. Lenin, she said. You mean John Lenin? <laughs> <laughs> she simply didn't make the connection. And what is most amazing about that is that she was Russian. She was from Moscow herself. You have to look quite hard to find a trace of the Russian Revolution in Russia now. They built all over it. You can buy a Mercedes or a sleek black armoured car. You can certainly buy a czarist banner, but red flags are at a real premium. So let's reflect just for a moment on what we should take away from this commemoration of 1917. The revolution has been an ideological football for a century. But let's remember not just how it happened, but above all, why. Russia's great October revolution was born in darkness and exclusion, nurtured by emergencies and wars. It was the product of thousands of dreams, but it was followed by hundreds of thousands, millions of deaths. The lessons for us are not about Lenin, nor even Marx. I think they're about securing inclusivity, equality, and social responsibility, about not setting back and letting injustice and corruption become entrenched. A century on from the Russian Revolution, there are still pressing questions about capitalism and global inequality. The mere pursuit of wealth is surely not the best way to create a fair and healthy world. Of course, Lenin got all his answers wildly wrong. We know for certain that the Russian Revolution didn't work. As Russians have been joking with me this whole year, we experimented with, ref with Leninist revolution so that you wouldn't have to. But the questions, Lenin's questions and our questions remain. And I think it's our duty to take them seriously. If we don't, 
the violence of revolution in some form or other may not remain a thing of the past. We don't want revolution, I promise you. So where does our path lie? Or do we accept that this is it? I hope we don't. Thank you.